Okay, I think uh, we are on time to start. So welcome back. And I'm very happy to introduce uh, the next speaker and is also the, the last speaker of the first day of the school. So uh, Andrea Banino is a colleague from DeepMind and is also an outstanding machine learning researcher working on artificial general intelligence. Andrea holds a PhD in neuroscience and artificial intelligence from UCL. And his research focuses primarily on deep learning systems, memory, and on exploring AI algorithms that can approximate elements of the brain. So today, he will be talking about investigating cognition and doing research at the critical juncture, junction between brain science and artificial intelligence. So thank you, Andrea, for being here tonight. And yeah, it's, I will leave you there. I'll talk to you. Thanks a lot, Francesco. Uh, and let me first thanks uh, all the, the organizer for having me here today. It's a great honor. And thanks for the introduction. I'm not sure about the outstanding. We'll see, we'll see. <laughs> uh, but um, I also want to thank all the audience that unfortunately I cannot see uh, because of the time that you are spending uh, with me today. And I hope we will embark on a short journey to talk about the brain and the tools that uh, we have nowadays to investigate uh, this amazing uh, machinery. Uh, hopefully it will be a journey uh, through cognitive neuroscience, computer science, and artificial intelligence. And uh, I hope the talk is going to be also a little bit controversial. So I hope I will get many questions at the end. And uh, hope, hopefully many of you will engage with me uh, at the end. Okay, so let's start. And let's start from a very macroscopic level. So our world is inherently complex. Uh, and all forms of life are constantly competing against each other for scarce resources. But despite this astonishing complexity, uh, despite the astonishing complexity of life on Earth, virtually all creatures, I believe, are stuck in the same loop. And this loop, uh, it's this. So they we first observe a state of the world, then we do some processing about the state we just observed, then we act by trying to maximize some form of success. And finally, we observe the next state. And this loop repeats tirelessly for all our lives, for the lives of any creature on Earth, right? Some of you can think of these maybe as like an RL loop, but the measure of success does not have to be a reward. It can be really anything. It can be just be surviving. And the nice thing about seeing life as this loop is that cognition can be seen as the characterization of this loop. And in, in this vein, it could be defined as the mechanism that process sensor information to perform goal-directed behaviors. What I like about this definition is that it does not exclude any creature. Instead, it sees cognition as a continuum where the possession of a particular cognitive ability depends on the information uh, processing capacity of the agent. So whether it's biological or artificial, it really doesn't matter. And in particular, one term that is critical about this definition is information. So information is not a physical quantity. And so it, it implies that its content can be handled by different physical substrates with the same resulting outcome. And this is particularly important in the context of this talk because I will take the endeavor of convincing you that artificial neural networks are currently the best tool we have to investigate cognition. However, to do so, I first need to convince you about this. So I need to convince you that actually your brain is not magical, I'm afraid, but it's just a computer, okay? So like your heart is a biological pump or your nose is a biological filter, your brain is nothing else than a computer, which is a machine that processes information in a lawful, systematic ways. So this might sound okay for some of you, might sound strange for others, or maybe disappointing, right? 
But let me explain exactly what I mean by computer, because I think there's a lots of confusion here. I'm also among very serious neuroscientists. So in order to, to define a computer, we first, first need to do a bunch of steps back. And the first one is to define an algorithm. So if you Google the word algorithm, I did Google the word algorithm the other day, and I got this definition as the first step. So it's a finite set of instructions to be followed automatically that result in a certain output given a certain input. So if you want to cook spaghetti tonight, then you simply follow a bunch of rules. And if you follow them well, you're going to get like a proper pasta at the end, right? And the same if you want to add two numbers. However, although very intuitive, this definition has a big problem, which lacks a scientific uh, method behind it. And this is precisely the reason uh, why some mathematician tried to give a more formal definition of algorithm. Because with this definition, there's no way we can prove that for a certain problem, there's no algorithm that we can uh, define for solving that problem. So I talked about mathematician. So let me introduce these two guys, uh, Alonso Church and Alan Turing. They set out to develop a formal definition of algorithms. And the two research work independently and amazingly, they came out with different solutions, but that are co mathematically completely equivalent. Church, so Church, Alonso Church, the, this guy on top, uh, developed lambda calculus and defined an algorithm as anything that could be done with lambda calculus. Turing invented Turing machine and defined an algorithm as anything that could be done with Turing machine. So, and this is the definition we are going to go with. And it's going to become clear, uh, hopefully, in the next few slides why. However, before moving on, I just want to make sure about one thing. So please keep in mind, for those of you that don't know, that a Turing machine is not a machine, right? It's just a mathematical tool. It's not a physical uh, construct. This is really important to keep in mind, as later this will be a key ingredient to understand the connection between Turing machine and brains. OK. so. An algorithm is anything that a Turing machine can compute. Now let's define computer. Okay, but first of all, computer, uh, what is a computable function? A computable function is defined as any task that can be solved using an algorithm. And from these, follow that a computer is just a physical device that implements an algorithm to solve, to solve a, com a computable function. Now the problem with these is that literally anything in the world is a computer then, like even a rock that follows the law of gravity, it's computing that function. Does it mean that a rock is, is the same as us or the same as your smartphone or, 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 or your computer? Clearly not. And to restrict the definition even more, we need to introduce one final term, which is universal Turing machine. So a universal Turing machine is a Turing machine that could be used to implement any other Turing machine. And in particular, but remember what I said before, right? A Turing machine is not a machine, it's a mathematical tool. And the mathematical tool that can implement any other algorithm is called Turing complete. That's why your uh, laptop or your phone through programs, through language uh, program like Python or C++ can do all the amazing stuff that they're able to do. So you can hopefully see now that our brains are probably a computer as well. And the reason is that uh, they implement various algorithms to solve computable functions, ranging from the most obvious one, like sorting a list or uh, adding two numbers or so on and so forth, to less obvious one, but still computable, like you, the, your uh, ability to run, to talk, to listen to this talk, to give a talk. And, and this is quite important because it's, they are universal Turing machine, but it's not like a single brain that can compute all the possible function. It's the brain collectively that can compute most likely all the possible function. So if you consider the set of all possible brains, then for any given computable function, there is probably an hypothetical brain that can solve it. That is why our brain is Turing complete. And the interesting thing 
is that computer scientists actually proved that uh, multi-layer and recurrent artificial neural networks are also too incomplete, meaning that you can implement any algorithm with them. And that's precisely the reason why you can do all the sort of impressive stuff with neural networks. And that's probably why the reason you are listening to me now or you're attending this school today. So again, this doesn't mean that for any given neural net, any given neural network can compute any function. Rather, it means that for any given function, there exists an hypothetical neural network that can compute it. So hopefully, now you can be with me in thinking that if we see brains and neural network through the lenses of compute, there are striking similarities between the two. So it does make sense to uh, investigate brains through the lenses of artificial neural network. So let's talk about brains then. So it's widely accepted that brain constitute one of the most complex and adapt adaptive machine discovered by evolution. They are characterized by many forms of linear activation that can adapt quickly. Uh, they can perform massive amount of parallel computation. They work at different time scale. I mean, they are amazing, right? Uh, the, the, but the nice thing about this is that all these features are kind of dancing together, effortlessly, to give rise to cognition in the form of perception, memory, attention, language, emotion. This is just to mention a few. So if we want to understand how these aspects of the mind relate to behavior, these will likely require a very different approach from the one that neuroscientists have been using. And I've been using myself uh, a long time ago, uh, which is normally called a reductionist approach. So which like very simple um, models that we are trying to explain basically everything with a single equation. I mean, it would be great if we can find a single equation to explain uh, what the brain do, but I came to the conclusion that it's basically impossible. So we should better find something else. I, obviously, I'm not the first one to think about that. Uh, this point was made clear by uh, an outstanding neuroscientist and computer scientist, uh, Mar, who proposed three different uh, levels for understanding such complex system. The first level is the function or the computation, and this defines uh, the goal that the system wants to achieve. So if you think about that bird, the goal could be flying. Uh, the second level is the algorithmic level. So these are the rules that the system implements to achieve the goal. So it would be like moving his wings uh, in order to, to fly. And the final step, it's the implementation level. This is the physical substrate. So in the case of the bird would be like, I don't know, I'm not really a, a, an ornithologist, but I guess will be some, some features of the feathers and the muscle uh, that are actually moving the wings in the way that it's needed to the bird to actually uh, fly. Very interestingly, the relation between these three levels is not arbitrary at all as the, the, the upper level, like the computation, the, the, the functional level, should be used to suggest the possible algorithm to support it. So it's kind of restricting the possible algorithm, which in turn predicts its mechanistic implementation. The process, by the way, works, or works also in reverse because the physical substrate, it's limiting the kind of possible algorithm that uh, the, the system can implement. So this framework, it's very important because it suggests that a fruitful approach to model cognition should be neither top-down nor bottom-up. Instead, the focus should be on a more systemic level. But this is pre precisely the reason why like traditional model, like probabilistic model, kind of reach the limit of what they can model in terms of cognition. Because if we want to account for all the three levels I'm talking about, then we will have to bake in too many assumptions. And by, and by definition, this will limit the generality of the model. So if the aim is to understand the function, the algorithmic level, and up to a certain extent, the mechanistic level, uh, then uh, my argument is that artificial neural network should be the choice. Uh, but what makes uh, artificial neural networks different from other modeling tools? 
I think the main difference is that these models do not require any domain specific knowledge. And actually to work, they only need three uh, agnostic ingredient. The first ingredient is data. So we have plenty of data uh, in the world about how we react to a certain stimuli. Even like if we only consider data coming from the lab, uh, that's precisely how many of the experiments in cognitive neuroscience are designed. So we typically uh, control the stimulus in an experiment and we look how uh, a participant react to that, those stimuli. Uh, and uh, the goal of this process is to understand the computational principle that are related the input to the stimuli to the output. The second ingredient after data is the model or the inductive bias. This is a key component. So you can think at the model as a function f, uh, let's see if I can use the pointer, a function f that maps an input x to an output y. And in the case of artificial neural network, these are the, uh, so in the case that I'm, I'm, I'm making, uh, this uh, theta here is represented by artificial neural network. So by a set of adjust adjustable free parameters or what are called weights. The function describes the neural architecture by which the sensor information is transformed and root to a response. So in the language of machine learning, it provides what we call the inductive bias that delimits the behavior of the system. The critical thing here is that with deep learning, uh, these functions are domain general. So the same architecture can be applied to several different domains. So think about uh, LSTM, they are applied to uh, language modeling, to audio modeling, same goes with convolution, or the recent transformer architecture, which I'm sure uh, you have heard of, uh, that can even uh, take several uh, modalities all at the same time. I said three ingredients. The last ingredient uh, is the uh, optimization procedure and objective function. So this is the procedure that we use to adjust the weights in the network. So in deep learning, we normally use something called gradient descent. Um, I'm not going to go into the biological plausibility of, back, of gradient descent and backpropagation as is a whole field on its own, and we don't have time now. Uh, but for those of you who are not familiar with that, you can think of this as a way of calculating the distance between the desired output and uh, one given a network and move uh, using the errors, uh, the, the weights of the network. Okay, so to sum up, uh, the difference, the reason why, sorry, um, artificial neural networks model are better to model cognition, it's basically threefold. So uh, uh, artificial neural networks are able to discover the structures in the data by only using domain general biases derived from the properties of the learning procedure and the network architecture. The approach is so general that even the learning procedure itself can be learned. So we can now learn how to the SGD, uh, so, sorry, we can learn stochastic gradient descent. We can even learn the architecture. Second, artificial neural network represents a systemic approach that keeps all the levels that I described before coming from Mar into account simultaneously. Whereas other models, uh, for instance, like probabilistic models are more top-down. Finally, artificial neural networks do not make any assumption regarding uh, the agent that generates the data. They are only concerned about mimicking the input and output behavior. Observe experimental. Okay, let me stop for a second. Everything I just said, it's not new. It's 40 to 30 years old. Uh, and uh, what we are seeing today, it's actually just a renaissance of the use of neural network to, con to model cognition. So there was um, some amazing work. That, uh, it was truly inspiring uh, when I was, I mean, I, I read about this stuff for my thesis. I reread it for preparing this presentation. And there was a bunch of, amazing researcher like uh, Inton, um, uh, Michael Jordan, um, Jay McLilland, that basically uh, Elman, um, Matt Bobbing, that's a deep mind as well, that basically 
like using simple computer that has a fraction of the, of the computational power that we have now, manage to uh, investigate function of the brain like language, attention, motor control, memory, vision, decision making, using exactly neural networks. And that was the time where no one was caring about neural networks. So, and the reason why they, 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 they did that uh, it's because they were mainly interested in, in uh, exactly these, the modeling that part. So, and by this, I mean modeling that part of cognition. And through that, they also managed to evolve uh, how we, uh, we the, the, our knowledge about neural networks. And I think this is the nice loop that I'm gonna get back in. So it's kind of the two things are always related, right? So you want to investigate, you want to model language? Okay, then you should be interested in how we produce language. And that's exactly what these people did. Okay, so there's a lot of talking, lots of theories. Maybe it's time to look at something more concrete. Uh, so I'm gonna shamefully use one of my work to uh, uh, actually talk, give you uh, uh, um, uh, uh, an empirical evidence that what I've just said is not completely crazy. And to do so, we are gonna talk a little bit about spatial navigation. So I'm sure you all uh, know that uh, as humans, but also many mammals have this amazing ability of transforming our uh, egocentric view into allocentric representation. So if I now ask you uh, to um, think about another room in the, in the apartment where you are, you can most certainly do that and you will probably do it by thinking at the room from a certain perspective. The reason um, why uh, we are so good at doing so was it's been like the, the central topic of investigation for more than 40 years uh, for both neuroscience and psychological re research. And all this research revealed that the, the, the brain is a portion of neurons in the medial temporal lobe that are devoted to represent the world, to, sorry, are devoted to change the coordinates from allocentric to, uh, to from egocentric to allocentric. Very briefly, uh, we have many cells. I, I would say the most famous one are the ones that are on the screen at the moment, uh, and in particular, play cell and grid cell that um, uh, were worth a Nobel Prize for the uh, in, in 2014, I believe, for the, the person the, that discovered them. So these uh, are cells that, as I said, are found in the um, medial temporal lobe. Uh, Air direction cell are basically neurons that fires any every time you look in a specific direction, again allocentric, so like north, northeast, something like that. Boundary cell are cells that fire, a, fire, so neurons that fire any time you get to a certain distance and orientation from a specific wall. Play cell are cells that fire any time you are in a particular location irrespectively of where you're looking at. And grid cell are cell that fires with this beautiful uh, hexagonal pattern. Again, uh, every time you are in a, in, a, in a location. So these are heat maps. So basically, sorry, I should have said that these are uh, basically uh, 2D maps, X, Y, and uh, the, the, the more uh, red, the higher is the, the, the frequencies of firing of that neuron. Anyway, the important thing is that these cells that you see on the top are the ones that we managed to replicate in a neural network, and we did so without baking in any prior knowledge. What this neural network was up uh, to do was simply maximizing the objective of uh, doing um, uh, self-localization. So this neural network was trained to uh, um, understand where it was. And it resulted in a series of uh, hidden units in the network that resemble exactly the ones that we found in, in rodents. And funnily enough, the first time uh, I presented this work to some postdoc in a, in a, in a lab that where they were all doing rat experiment, I managed to trick them uh, to, and make them believe that these were real cells. So actually that's the point when we realized that maybe we are doing something interesting. But it's more than that. Uh, I don't want to go too much into the mathematical details of the, of the plots at the bottom, but the one interesting number is these one 
1.66. So this is basically a ratio between two models. And that ratio is exactly the same ratio between modules that you see in rodents. And it's impossible for any model that I know, like any closed form mathematical model to have baked that number uh, in if you want to do it manually, right? Or if you want to design an equation to do that. It was simply too difficult. This model developed it as a function of optimizing the objective as well. But recently we saw something even more interesting. So this is a recent work that uh, we, I was involved in uh, uh, with other colleagues at DeepMind. And here, again, these are like strange plots, but basically the, the, what they, they, are gonna, they, they are trying to tell you is that even the weights, so the way in which the weights into the artificial neural networks are arranged, it's exactly the same one as we see in the brains of, uh, of a fly. So the, really the architecture also evolved to be the same. And again, we didn't, we didn't push the network to do that in any way. Okay, so enough about spatial navigation. Let's conclude. We are gonna to go towards the end of this talk. So let's talk about language. Uh, and I would like to talk a moment. I'm sure you're all familiar with the amazing stuff that uh, uh, both Google with BERT and OpenAI with GPT-X123 has been doing. These two technologies are mainly based on, on transformer which it's, it's an amazing, it's an amazing neural network. Um, but what I want to highlight here, it's not the greatness of this model because something that might have gone missing about these approaches is that they are based on the research of the group of psychologists that I mentioned before. So those people were the same, the very first people that uh, set out to uh, uh, use neural network to investigate uh, language. So we should ask why they did that and why uh, now we see this model doing so well with language. And I think the, the, the answer to that is because it uh, became clear that like rule-based system uh, reach a certain limit. And the reason uh, of that is they fail to capture the multivariate non-linear nature of semantic composition that it's at the base of language and we still yet don't understand completely. And it's precisely this composition, uh, this ability of, with its compositional ability, that it's what transformer does very well. Uh, and so I believe this is again, another example of uh, the intersection between machine learning and neuroscience. So we started from psychology, we went to machine learning, and now there are people using this tool, like GPT-3, to investigate language in the brain. And this is amazing. Okay, so I believe I use enough time of your attention, so it's time, it's time to conclude. So there is much we don't know about brains, but we do know, and hopefully I convince you, that they are not magical. They are just exceptional complex range of matter. And the, the, but there is no reason, right? There is no reason to think that brains are exempt from the law of computation, that it's uh, every, everything else obeys too. Um, and I truly believe that with uh, artificial neural networks, we can finally grasp uh, a better understanding of these brains. So if your brain is if you're a computer, then the computer that should uh, highlight what, how your brain works, it's probably an artificial neural network. But if you have to take away one message from this presentation, then it's probably this slide. So neither artificial neural network nor neuroscience can live one without the other, especially these days. Most of the more powerful approaches in artificial neural networks are informed by, or have been informed by neuroscience, even if only at the algorithmic level. And think about it. Our brain, after all, is the only proof that general artificial intelligence can be created. Well, maybe also the brain of, uh, I should be fair, also the brain on, of other animals is pretty amazing. But also, if you are a neuroscientist, artificial neural network really represent a shift from the traditional way of modeling cognitive function. So most of, most of the work that do, it's done today, it's performed using simple interpretable model 
based uh, on data control in very uh, on data collected in very controlled experiment. Artificial neural network instead are a complex model that can work in real world domains, sometimes by approximating human level complexity. This means that by employing this model, we might finally be able to shift away from the common reductionist approach and finally grasp a real meaning on what's going on in our head. I truly believe we are just scratching the surface of what this model can do, as we are still in a low uh, data and computational regime. But these two aspects are growing fast and they're growing together. And so grows our ability and the ability of artificial neural networks to match the biological one. So exciting time are ahead of us. And I hope you all will be part of building this. And I hope you also had some fun listening to this talk. Thank you very much.